continue their progress towards um, a civil society. They've made great strides. They almost, you know, I think of them almost as the Jews of Africa. They have come out of the uh, awful experience of genocide and are rebuilding a modern society, almost like the Jews did in Israel. She's also an educator. She teaches at Consumers College History. And she also lectures all over the United States and internationally on the Rwandan genocide. <coughs> we are also very honored today to have with us <coughs> Simon. And I'm going to read his name here because I'm not as fluent in his name yet. And Simon's name is Muda Hab. Hogora. Buddha Hogora? Did, did I kill it really bad? Buddha Hogora. Simon, Simon was orphaned by the genocide. Um, but his story has a very uh, warm hearted uh, beginning because he's only beginning his life. And that is, he was adapted by the Globuses. And they are here today. These are Simon's parents. And uh, he is a college student and hopes to go on, if I remember correctly, from November and study political science. He's already in college. So I don't think I've forgotten any of it. And if I have, Lucille and Simon will uh, remind you of it. So why don't you give a warm welcome? Hello, <laughs> how are you? I, I just want to thank again Myrna and the people in the Alliance, all my friends here. We, I've come here for how many times? I, I don't even remember, but I can tell you that the healing process that people who have survived genocide, uh, including myself, was a, a big process, and I think Sonoma was one of the, the factors in trying to heal from genocide. Uh, Simon, today I'll give more time to Simon, because Simon was in Rwanda when the genocide happened, and uh, he, he lost almost everything. We did, but at least we were in the United States, we didn't see firsthand the killing, you know, what was taking place. Excuse me. So I, the way we are, it's okay. <laughs> I will put it out. <laughs> we have a very fancy green center, though. Thank you. Is this the one? <laughs> ah. Huh. Is it better now? Craig, could you come down and plug this in? Is it plugged in? <coughs> it's not plugged in. Okay. Why don't you go around? Yeah, so I think we have the presentation in three parts. I'm going to talk briefly about the post-genocide in Rwanda and what the country has been able to, to do to address genocide. And Simon will talk about his experience as an individual who has survived genocide and has been able to, how would I say it? I mean to, to lead a normal, pretty normal life after genocide. And then we'll show the part of reconstruction or at least what our association has tried to do is to address the plight of survivors in the country. And I, the last part will be about showing a couple of pictures of some of the, the children we have been helping, but also uh, Sonoma State is, is an organization or, or institution has helped you know, to deal with, especially in doing fundraiser, starting a school, and so on and so forth. I never separated my experience with Sonoma State, to tell you the truth. It has been one of the most uh, incredible supporter of the initiatives we've, we've built in Rwanda. We've had a chance to take a couple of students from this institution, uh, the ones who took your class, and uh, they were part of the, that experience of trying to rebuild what we call a torn society. Uh, 
I'm not going to talk uh, about uh, Simon. Can you help me with this? I'm going to begin with a picture and the music because those are really important today about what I'm going to talk about a little bit. You know, and if you can look, you'll see. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is, we are commemorating the 18 year anniversary of Rwanda genocide, the Tutsi genocide in Rwanda. And uh, for the first time, we have decided to make it a nationwide event for a number of reasons. Uh, we make it in North America because we want also people from Canada and, and, and all the people in North America to come to the commemoration. And we chose Washington, D.C. because also we want to involve people in the policy, but also the U.N. and so on and so forth. That's why we chose Washington, D.C. And from, from what is happening, we have quite a few people who, who are coming for the commemoration and who are going to address that particular uh, genocide commemoration. <coughs> Debates about commemorations have been taking place in the country, in Rwanda, especially because Rwanda is unique in a number of ways. <coughs> the victims and perpetrators live in the same country. Uh, there was much entertained idea of having two land, Tutsi land and Hutu land. And those are, uh, the, the thought never really <laughs> was able to materialize because it's impossible. Because when we talk about the Tutsi genocide in Rwanda, it's not when you look at people who are so separated that you can actually create two countries. Uh, when we talk about the genocide in Rwanda, it's one of the most incredible things to happen to a society because we are talking about a family sometimes. You know, so meaning that if you split the country, it means some family members will go to one country, the other ones will go to the other country. So when we talk about the issue of reconciliation, for us it's, a, it's a, an imperative. It's not something that people choose. You know, reconciliation and trying to build the peace. Uh, regardless of the liabilities that sometimes is contained within the formula is necessary for us. Because we are talking about the failure of all the major institutions. We talk about the church, we are talking about the family, and. Each one of us here, if we talk about Simon or Denise, they can tell you members of our own family who were among the killers. So it's not that clear cut way when you come and you look at the people here, we versus them. It's impossible to look at the Rwandan society. But at the same time, I also believe that those challenges presented more opportunities to create a society never seen before. And I, I can attest, uh, based upon, for instance, what has been, uh, has been achieved in Rwanda for the last 17, 18 years, that sometimes it's a short of a miracle. Rwanda has instituted what they call the scorecard. The scorecard is a mechanism of self-assessment, you know, where you go and you say, okay, in terms of reconciliation, in terms of the economy, in terms of political space, that's one of the biggest things, especially when we talk about Rwanda within the Western uh, connotation. People talk about, okay, so economically the country is developed. How about the political space and so on and so forth? So there are many things that that scorecard has to be revised every year. And when you look at the progress that has been done, for instance, since 2000, uh, 2007 to now, it is incredible. 
you know, and this is when the people themselves tell you what has happened with their own mist. Uh, we, there are a couple of reasons that came from Rwanda. Number one, really, for me, is that there is no unity of community that can prevent a genocide if there is a bad leadership. Rwanda was a moral society before. We prided ourselves of having the same language, the same culture, same religion, living in the same neighborhoods, intermarriages, but it didn't stop the worst genocide of our times. And you can look at, you know, you are a sociology major, you know all those theories, like political theories, you know, whatever theories that can explain a conflict. But however it is, is that the bad leadership combined by poverty and so on led to genocide. So what the country has been involved in for the last 18 years, uh, and the civil society has been to try to address that bad leadership. You know, and you can argue that the leaders in Rwanda are not good leaders, but they have been able to influence, at least to give a direction of what the post genocide society should be. We got to exclusion, uh, to, to divisionism in our country, in our society. Uh, and that was to build the otherness. Otherness that sometimes people start with the colonialism, that you can go as far as even in, in pre-colonial societies. I'm not one of those people who can always blame whatever comes to Africa about colonialism. You know, something exists that can create those entities uh, and, and, and to create the otherness. But it's true that the crystallization of the other came during the colonialism. It's when it became crystal. You know, people were separate and it led to genocide, you know, however you see it uh, during this time. So the last, the last thing I wanted to mention before I go to, to my thing is that there are strategies that are uniquely Rwanda and they call homegrown solutions to build long-lasting long peace. And all the uh, institutions, whether you are talking about the civil society, you are talking about the political establishment, are, are doing that in the whole country. And, and sometimes, to tell you the truth, from outside, people can't understand. But I'm going to talk about two things. Because this has been, if, for instance, you were in our conference in Sacramento, uh, we had issues because we had invited the Kagame, the president of Rwanda, and for most, the fact that Kagame was uh, a dictator, he doesn't leave any political space, and so on and so forth. And I'm not here to defend or to talk about Kagame. That's not obviously what I'm doing. But based upon the direction he has given to the country, and the, the incredible challenges he was facing, it's short of a miracle of how people have been. Uh, and, and to see how people are able to, to fit within those institutions. I'll tell you briefly about those institutions that have been created. <coughs> One of the, the cornerstone of ending genocide and to teach against it has been education. Education has been pretty much uh, promoted in Rwanda, in the country. To give you an example, this is unprecedented in any sub-Saharan Africa for the last three months, uh, no, four months. Two major institutions of higher learning from the United States have accepted to go and open a campus in Rwanda. One is Harvard University, one is uh, Carnegie Mellon. They went to Rwanda because of a number of things. Usually they don't go to Sub-Saharan Africa because of lack of security, uh, lack of technology, all those kind of stuff. So, and what it will do, it doesn't mean it's for this elitist type of institution I'm talking about. But it reflects exactly the, 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 the kind of respect the country has commanded since the genocide and what they have been trying to do for the country. Uh, but not only that for the security, but also the advances in the technology and so on and so forth. Uh, Rwanda is known as the, the Silicon Valley of East Africa. And it's, it's emerging that way. And the, the main reason is to know so much about praising how far it has been, but it is to show that to go from a genocide and to be able to stand on their own two feet, to be acknowledged by the World Bank, what they have been able to do, it's short of a miracle. 
every year, every year now in Rwanda, the people who graduate from university are the same numbers as the people who have graduated for the last 30 years. Every year, we are talking about, you know, when we say people who finish uh, because of the increase in, uh, in schools, whether they are private, they are uh, uh, private or, or state-based, but every year they graduate more than the people who were graduated from 1963 to 1993. So just to show you the increase in education and what it does. So we are hoping that, and, and the education is not just academic type of education. And, uh, you know, just to tell you, like the association, we have Friends of Rwanda Association, is focusing on more vocational type of education for people who didn't have the opportunity to attend. And these are people who were, prima who were going to be left behind. Uh, they didn't have any place to live. They didn't have parents. Uh, and it gave them hope, but also uh, a certain purpose to life when we talk about what you can achieve. So there are a number of things that have been uh, strategies to build the peace that I, I want to mention. They are in Chinya Rwanda, but I try to, uh, to translate. One is called uh, Imihigo. Imihigo is a system that has been established in the whole country, and it, it's, a, it's like a comp nice and competitive way to produce. Local people set up target, targets of what they need to achieve and they write something, they sign. For instance, in terms of reconciliation, when the groups will come together, uh, economic development, if you are farmers, you have to produce this for your own communities, uh, communal work, I mean, all the, the, the things are spelled out. And then they sign. And that kind of mihigo is done every year. So people come, and they are going to give a report. And if there's no kind of implementation, then the problem is this. Then you have to say why you didn't implement your plan. You know, do you need the help from this particular thing? You have to write what you need to achieve your objectives. So that's one of the things that has been, that has helped the country in what we call decentralization. Because people are not relying on central authority or the state, because the, the Mihigo are local. They are local initiative. The second one is you know, known as Ingando. Ingando, and I can send, I couldn't start my, my thing, but Ingando was meant to bring all the young people because one of the, the biggest area of security is to try to get the young people together. Uh, we, you've heard about children soldiers. Uh, sometimes even if you look at the killers in Rwanda, they were mostly young people. Who, who were completely, uh, didn't have any kind of economic leverage, didn't have anything to do. So this became the, the executioners, they, they, they killed. So Ingando is supposed to teach those young people how they, they can see the other in a positive, in a more positive way. You know, to see diversity, but positively, not to see the other and the one you, you should kill, because he's taking away from your perspective. And, the last one that I talk about is known as Umuganda. Umuganda is communal work. You know, if you don't want to work, you don't want to go on in the farm, don't travel in Rwanda on Saturday. Because if, if you are driving Saturday morning, people stop you. You have to go and work. Whether you are the president of the country, whether you are the military, you have to stop and go in that communal work. And it's not just for production. Even though they have been able to produce economically, but it's also to bring people together. You know, people who work together, who talk, uh, can also really start talking about the positive stuff about their countries instead of thinking in killing their neighbor and so on and so forth. You've probably heard, and this is for our mascot four, uh, that's the grand, grandson of, uh, of Rari, because he's named after Fora or vice versa. But this, for instance, what do they call the peace basket? The peace basket has been an element of reconciliation in Rwanda. So when you go and visit the country, one of the things you see are the women. The women sit together, whether they are Hutu, they are Tusi, they, 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 they weave, they, they make those baskets. They are both useful in the, in the rural area, but also can be a symbol. So they are called the peace baskets and they are very important in the Rwandan community. So, uh, so economic, 
uh, economic togetherness, all those kind of stuff are, are geared towards helping the people to come together and to try to reconcile their society. One of the, the positive thing coming out of Africa and Rwanda in the, this particular sense is that Rwanda is expanding. You know, it's a small land of the country that can explain also what has happened in the past. But they are building relationships with the whole East African community. You know, so Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, and, and uh, Burundi. Meaning that opening the borders also is in the, the, the population push that can uh, drive people to genocide or, or mass killing to try to get to the land. Uh, same with the Congo. You've probably heard about the Congo, you know, the march that is taking place in Santa Rosa, they are, they are focusing on Congo and, and uh, Darfur. But Congo is one of the countries that suffered a lot and as a consequence of genocide, you know, Maybe telling us that if you don't contain genocide, it's not contained within the national boundaries. What happened in Rwanda led to the mass killings in the Congo? You know, because all these people are leaving the country, they are establishing themselves in the Congo, and, and exactly that's what happened. So, but right now Rwanda and Congo are working to try to ease the borders, but at the same time also to, to see how they can do the communication, but also economic interest. Uh, they have in the middle a lake that is very rich in natural uh, gas. They are trying to do it uh, in, a joint, uh, in a joint economic ventures and it's creating uh, some kind of uh, uh, friendship. When I go to, uh, to Rwanda, believe it or not, the, the most, the largest population of people who come to volunteer to Rwanda are Congolese and yet when you are here, you think that Rwanda and Congo are fighting every day. You know, that's pretty much how people have seen the, the two countries. I'm going to maybe later on conclude uh, and talk briefly about what Fora has done by showing the pictures and then I'll go along with that because it's really important uh, in my view to, to see how the initiatives of people, including yourself, can change the, the, the lives of people wherever they are, you know, it takes one person, one initiative, a group of people to try also the prospects of the people. And uh, we've, uh, the center we have been helping also has a room called uh, Sonoma. Sonoma because of, you know, we, we put the money that the students have been collecting in that particular room. So the people who were in Rwanda with us were uh, about 20 people last summer and we were able to cut the ribbon for the new school. And one of the room, one of the, uh, the, the classroom will be called the Sonoma, you know, because of this connection, especially in the fundraiser that it is uh, promoted. It's always difficult to talk about how people can uh, help people who survive in Rwanda because I, we really let Simon talk about this. You know, I, I didn't touch on genocide because I think it's better to hear from him. Who was there, you know, I, and uh, you know, he was able to experience genocide and what it meant for a young kid who is growing. So the, the, the children who started with the group were his age. They were his age or, or, or much younger, actually. You know, because we got people all the way from 18 months, uh, and I think the oldest was about 10. You know, and these are people who didn't have any family. Uh, Simon and, and her sister and brother got a family that was, <laughs> you know, people when they die, they go to heaven immediately. But, uh, <laughs> you know, so, it, but even today, you know, I mean those children who were children during genocide have reproduced, you know. So now in that particular region, and that's why Simon, I want you to see my, my little thing if you can. Just one picture and then we, we continue. But now we have uh, the future of Rwanda is in the hands of young people. But most young people have their liabilities. You know, you, you are looking at people who, who have lost their parents or whose parents were connected with the killings. So when you talk about looking at a society, it has been 
one of the toughest things to bring the community together. And the main reason I, I'm talking about this is that when we talk about this commemoration, it's the first. When we are trying to bring all the Rwandans in the diaspora, without looking at their ethnicity especially. You know, we, we, this is what we, we try to build, what we call a collective memory. This is a tragedy for every Rwandan. Whether you were on the side of the killer, you know, sometimes we inherited one of the most horrible legacy of belonging to a family that has killed. So we are trying to bring these, these people for, for, for uh, you know, for, for, for the future. And this is why we encourage especially young people like Simon to, uh, to be there, because the people understand what they are talking about. You know, they, they've experienced the same. There are children who are running, whose parents are brought back to justice, and they didn't choose that right. They didn't choose their parents to kill. And uh, so that's the biggest challenge that we have. At the same time, also opportunities, because we have many young people who are driven, very high driven, who are talking about uh, never again that we might see in our lifetime in Rwanda, because uh, the whole society is, is turned on those, those kind of stuff. So, um, So I, yeah. We we show some of the the pictures for for the the friends of Rwanda when we were there, but uh, or we can start with that if you want. Since I'm in the middle, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> being I was going to show you the the young people together and what they have been able to do yeah This is one of the, yeah. So every, every year you, you find people who, who are assembled. <coughs> These are students who, uh, who are orphans. They are orphans of genocide. And as a matter of fact, if you go to the next one, you'll find that, for instance, the, in front of them, they are also, uh, the, they are trying to bury their parents. Because the day of the graduation was the day they were burying the bones. You know, usually in, in, in terms of when you, yeah, here, you can see it. So you might think this is a very sad thing, but for them it's one of the, the most incredible, joyous moment. Because once you go and you get your graduation, these were graduating in the school, at the same time find the bones of your parents, it's like a, a jackpot. You know, and for, I don't know if you can imagine for the last 17 years there are people who are still trying to dig to find those bones. You know, whether you, you'll ever know they are your parents' bones or not, that's, uh, that's something else. But symbolically, symbolically, it makes you move forward. Once you have put them in a, in, in a, in a barrier that people can go and, and visit and do those kind of stuff. So when we talk about our going back and looking at the, the way it is, even at Kimenyi's uh, memorial service, you understand that death 
This is, is, is a constant in Rwandan society, even today. And all the policy, if you talk about uh, you know, state policy, you are talking about whatever initiatives that have been tried in the last 17 years are around genocide and how to address the issues of genocide. Whether it's in the economy, whether you talk about you know, decisions in the government, you know, who you are going to put as a prime minister, the one who will be in the military, all these things are in response to genocide. And, but not genocide as, as a reactive thing, but as a proactive means to try to stop genocide in the future. So that's what people have been doing and all the, those initiatives uh, that I can send you uh, in Kinyarwanda, that are called homegrown initiatives, are being studied in foreign countries. You know, sometimes they talk about the truth and reconciliation in South Africa. Rwanda has unique ways to look at that. And when we talk, for instance, uh, and I finish with this so Simon can speak, when we, we talk, for, for instance, about the, the whole process of democratization, this is one of the biggest bone of contention in today's uh, government. Because most people say, uh, you know, Kagame is maintaining himself because he's a dictator. You know, he's, he's not around the political space. Th this is one of the biggest issues. At the same time, the only thing I want you to, 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 to think about is what's the meaning of survival? You know, and, and when you think about Rwanda sandwich, it's a sandwich between three countries that are really what you might call failed states. They don't function, right? You are talking about Congo, you talk about Burundi that is at war, you are talking about, uh, you are talking about even Uganda. You know, you've heard about Kony, right? Have you seen Kony? So all of these countries have their, their issues. Security is not one of the biggest ones. So the priority in Rwanda is security. And because you can't build the last long lasting peace without any sense of security. And just to go back, think about your own country, United States. When the Civil War was over, United States for 10 years was a dictatorship. Security was more important. You know, you had to in install peace, put the military, before you can actually think about that kind of thing. And this is about survival. It's about trying to mend the fabric of society. And I, I'm not, there are many stuff I can criticize about Rwanda and the government, but when you think about where the country has been, and trying to say the democratic voice, democracy killed the people in Rwanda. I, I'm not saying, no, 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 that's a statement I don't want you to carry, but, <laughs> but the people killed because supposedly they were democratic, they needed that democracy, UN was there. They allowed the people to kill because so-called minority has been oppressive, and that the formula didn't save the people. So when you are implementing democracy, you have to be, what kind of democracy are we talking about? Applied to what? You know, so when you, so these are, are, are discussions that Rwanda is not immune to, because there is a push to democratize, and what they are doing is to start in those kind of initiatives that are from the bottom instead of the top. So they are talking about the top, in, the bottom instead of the top. It means when you write the people's initiative, uh, like for instance the Imihigo and so on and so forth, come on the surface, then eventually those ones will, will democratize the whole nation, right? You see, from the community base instead of from the political sphere. So it, those are the discussions that when you go to Rwanda, maybe you have a chance to study. But at the same time, uh, think that um, Genocide is one of those most horrible things that it's very difficult to come up with responses that are easy to make or, or uh, you know, and, and the challenges are still there. So before we, we do the pictures, I want Simon to come and talk about his story. And he's, uh, I can tell you, people talk about the heroes, he's my hero. Because, the, you know, we are talking about the people who we're able to survive, but also we're able to continue and, and to inspire and to aspire to higher, higher things. So Simon, please. Okay, so just a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Simon, like she said. Uh, 
I am 27 years old. I went to genocide, started in Rwanda, I was 10 years old. Uh, okay, so when I was 10 years old, I lost my parents, my grandparents, uncles, aunts, neighbors. Uh, my survivor was pure luck. It was early April when my family's friends from the north came uh, to the south. Um, they were migrating from the north, going to Burundi, which was just south of Rwanda. They were terrified. At that time, my family did not want to go with them. My grandparents didn't believe that the neighbors that we've been living next to for so many years could actually come to our house and kill us all. We spent many nights in the forest because we were scared. One of the main reasons my parents didn't want to leave uh, is because we had a beautiful cows. And my grandparents felt they didn't want the in their family to slaughter our cows. So my grandparents and my parents died because they want to save the cows. A few, day, few days later, things got worse. Finally, my parents agreed to go to Burundi. The next day, I was asked to go to Burundi's border to check if my aunt, who left with that family, if they have met it. Also, my parents felt that we should not travel in big groups. I remember telling them that I was no way I was going alone unless they sent somebody else with me. That is how my, si my younger sister, Regine, survived. She was eight years old at the time. It took us two and a half hours to walk to the border. We were both terrified of who might see and recognize us. We arrived at the border only to realize that the situation had gotten worse. All we saw was a bunch of wounded people try to, <coughs> a bunch of wounded people Excuse me. <clears throat> Try to escape, screaming, and all we saw was houses being burnt down. That night we stayed out in the bushes hiding with my uncle who lived near the border. It was the longest night of my life. By this time, it was too late to go back home. Given that we couldn't swim and there was only one boat left, in the river since the rest were destroyed by inter Hamway. My uncle gave us two choices. Either you go back home and die or cross the river now and live. We chose option A. The river was, dead, was full of dead bodies. For the longest time, I had nightmares about this river. After two hours of walking through the swamps, we finally reached the camps. We had nothing but shorts and t-shirts on our backs. At the camp, we met up with our aunt who was very glad to see us. We waited and waited and waited for the rest of the family to show, but nobody ever showed up. I'm here today because of Fora and its members. I have these great parents who I'm proud to call my parents that they not only take us in and take great care of us, like, one of, like some of their own children, they also raised my younger sister, Regine, and my younger cousin, Denise. Denise, could you please stand up? <laughs> they made this immediate decision minutes after learning about Fora from my Aunt Matilda who's also the president of FORA, like your instructor told you. They did not need any time to think about whether they wanted to help. They knew right away in their hearts this is exactly what they wanted to do. They walk up to Matilda and say, how can we help? These type of people make the world a better place. They have done so much for three strangers' kids who they didn't know 
And on behalf of my sisters and I, we can never thank you enough for all of you given up and all you've done to help us. Can we please meet my parents? <laughs> My other sister, Regine, couldn't be here today because she had to work. <laughs> I recently graduated from University of Oregon with a bachelor's degree in economics, a business minor, and soon to have another minor in mathematics. My sister, Regine, has a job which she loves and very good at it, and my cousin, Denise, is a junior at San Francisco State University, soon studying philosophy. <laughs> I believe that all the genocide survivors survive for a reason. What is my reason? Being part of Fora makes me realize what's important in life. It is being kind to one another. It is helping those in need. Fora gave me the help I needed in time that I needed it. And I will forever be grateful for that. I got an education and I intend to use it to help others in any way I can. Helping all these genocide survivors like myself, teaching the world about Rwanda and its beauty, answering any questions of what happened in Rwanda, redirecting those who have been lied to that the genocide never happened, and keeping in mind that Rwanda is my home, and therefore it is my res responsibility to help, help rebuild it. This is why I survived. It hurts me when I hear a person in a great position to teach claiming that the genocide never happened. I was there. Genocide did happen. We need to pull our voices together and let these people know that what they say hurts many of us. Not only does this make it almost impossible to heal, but it repeatedly takes us back to 1994. I want I want to thank, once again, I want to thank Fora and all its members and all my new family for giving my sisters and I a second chance at life, for all the great work they do, and for many lives they save. This past summer, I got a chance to go back to Rwanda. It was my first time since the genocide. The feelings I felt can't, can't be put into words. From the day I arrived to the day I left, it felt like a dream. In Rwanda, I visited many places. Some places brought up good memories, others brought up the bad. What hurt the most was visiting the genocide for the first time, my parents' grave, and my, where my home used to be. This place is in our jungle. When I got home later that day, I picked up a pen and start writing. The whole time I spent visiting my home property, I was angry. But more than anything, I was afraid. I was afraid which killers I might run into. I was afraid of who, I might, who might be hiding in the jungle and ready to take me out, just like they did my parents and the rest of my family. I was also afraid who might not want to see me here. This is one of the biggest challenges Rwanda faces, fear. Try imagining having the person who killed your family as your neighbor. Aside the bad, these bad feelings, I was excited once again to be home, to be in Rwanda. I was impressed of how much reconstruction has, has been done on some parts of the country. I was imp impressed on how much reconstruction has been done on some of the country, I was impressed on how good economy is doing, how good technology is, public transportation, and more. Even though there's still tons of work to be done, this country still is truly beautiful. I want to thank all of you who are here today for to show, showing your support. This country needs a, every available helping hand. Genocide is a terrible, terrible thing. I never thought it could happen to me, so therefore, it could happen to you. So let's put our hands together and fight it, because it could happen anywhere to anyone.
want to thank Mathilde, and I want to thank all of you for allowing me to speak to you today. You're all the future leaders, and for all you here today, I believe in my heart that you're all good people. Let's learn from our past and create a bright future. Thank you. Before I let Matilda talk to you again, I have one more thing to mention. She probably wouldn't say this herself. On April 28th of this year, Matilda is receiving 2012 Peace and Justice Award from the staff and board of the Center, Center for African Peace and Conflict Resolution at CSU Sacramento in recognition for her sustained leadership and indomitable service in the fight against genocide and rehabilitation of its victims, especially in Rwanda. <laughs> Few of the past recipients of this award include first female Chief Justice of Ghana, the Honorable Georgina Theodora Wood, former Consul General of South Africa, Honorable Kevin Johnson, Mayor of Sacramento, and Honorable Barbara Lee, U.S. Congresswoman, and Des Desmond Tutu of South Africa, I think. are going to show you a couple of the pictures when Simon was in Rwanda and uh, Fora, Friends of Rwanda Association. And Simon is going to, you can remember, my brain is not working. <laughs> Okay, so this picture over here was my second day in Rwanda after 14 years. It was at the hotel, and we had a celebration for my <laughs> uncle who passed away last summer, Alexander Kimenyi. So this was his celebration. And this one, we're just uh, giving a speech. A little say something, everyone had to say something. That's my and my tail. <laughs> This one was uh, at the genocide in Kigali, the Genocide Museum. Uh, I was, it was my first time there, and uh, yeah, I cried. Some more pictures of the Genocide Museum. This was our bus. Uh, we were there for 28 days. We had this bus every day. And uh, thanks to Mathilde, we traveled the whole country. Uh, that's uh, the picture of us at the house. Uh, the two ladies over there, that's uh, Lisa and Chris. The white hair, that's Chris, and the other one is Lisa. 
Here is at the border of Rwanda, Tanzania, and Uganda. So we're visiting three countries all in one spot. <laughs> that is my Aunt Mathilde, her son Dahiro, and, uh, and uh, a guy in Rwanda. He was teaching Dahiro the meaning of life in Kenya Rwandan, and Dahiro does not speak Kenya Rwandan. <laughs> That's uh, the, my parents' grave. So that's all my, all my uh, family members in Rwanda who did not make it out of Rwanda. Uh, that's, uh, up top, that's K Alexander Kimenyi's dad. Next, next is my grandpa. Next is my, that's Denise's dad. And the rest is just family members. Uh, the grave uh, with the uh, Rwandan's friends, uh, my aunt Mateo, that's my uncle Jackie and Brown, my aunt Jackie and Brown over there. More pictures of the grave. My uncle Ange and my aunt Mateo are the grave. More pictures of the grave. So these do you want to explain it or you want me to do it? Okay. So there is a school that Fora built for survivors in Rwanda. And these are some of the tools they give for the ladies to learn how to sew. So we visited there. And you can keep going. So those, these are the ladies uh, dancing for us. It was a great time. We had a great food, music, dancing. And this is the new school before we. We had a school, now they are building their own school, the students. More ladies dancing. Those are all students, all of them. They all wear uniforms. I don't think you guys have to wear uniforms here. <laughs> uh, that's, that was Chi back. The last picture, that was Chia joining in dancing. This year was at the... <laughs> Hey, go back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, Rwandan's finest, little movie star that we found. His, his name is Gisa. And that's his brother next to him, Shema. Yeah, they were big hit in Rwanda. <laughs> So here we're just taking a tour of Rwanda, learning a lot. Uh, that's the Rwanda's, that's a cow right there. Look at the big horns. Here, go back. Look a little bit. That's a king. That's a, the king's cow. Do you want to explain a little more about the king's cow? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, In the corner. With <laughs> you know, the wealth in Rwanda is measured in cows, not money. So if you come and I give you a cow, it's because I love you to death. So those are the royal cows, you know, the ones with long horns. Uh, usually they could entertain. So that's the residence of the king, the traditional residence. Uh, you know, we're looking at the cow. Yeah. So those cows, when we went to visit them, they have a caretaker. And when that guy sing, starts singing, so all the cows walk towards him and start dancing along with him. It was amazing. I never seen a cow dance before, but was, it was pretty awesome. Yeah. Uh, this is at the grave here. They so were walking away. You know, sad. Um, this was at the school. Maybe Matilda wants to say a word about it. Yeah, we we are breaking new ground for the new school where they we got the land. So they are going to extend the, the, the school. We have about 400 people who are waiting for, uh, for education in the region. So we got to the land, and that land is my grandfather's land, but no one is left. So we are using the land for schooling and so on and so Yeah, so at the school they have a picture of Kimeni, so it's, you know, he helped a lot. 
Also, that's uh, to all the people that helped. Uh, Sonoma, it's right there, number two. They misspelled it, but uh, it's Sonoma. It's Sonoma. Sonoma. If you didn't know, it's they misspelled it. It's Sonoma. So, each school that is built with it, uh, the people there, they have a different classrooms. So, Sonoma and then Kimeni, they have, a, you know, so they have studied to build. So, that's a plaque for all the special things, so the people that made it happen. Uh, go back, go back, go. So this is a, that's not this one, but the other house, that's the house we stayed in. So like I was saying, uh, Rwanda's economy is doing well. They're rebuilding it nicely. Uh, they're nice houses. Go to the next one. And that's the one we stayed in. So there was about probably 25 of us there in that house. But it was a party every day. <laughs> And uh, that's my cousin, that hero, and that kid couldn't separate him. Yeah. And then uh, this is going to my, oh, my, where my home used to be. It's a jungle, just, as you can see. There's, the road doesn't exist anymore. You just kind of got to find your way through. That road used to be very big. It used to be popular. But yeah, not anymore. That's uh, me and Matteo. So, you want me to talk this about is the house? Yeah. The houses. The houses for widows, yeah. Okay. So, Fora helped build all those houses for the widows. There's, uh, I think, 54. Yeah, 54. 54 houses. So, and they all are right next to that school. And uh, where we went, Fora, uh, and, you know, put together, we got jerseys. Uh, soccer balls for all the kids at that school and uh, the next few pictures there they have their jerseys on looking like a team and uh, yeah they were very happy to get those gifts and this is that's this is Mattel's car <laughs> so they gave it to her because they love her for all she done all the great work she's done for them that's a special thanks just the car and the baby I think at this point, if you have questions for Simon or you know, myself, that would be good. Thank you so much. Questions? What happens to the, the orphans in Rwanda that aren't adopted by family where, where do they go? We have. And that's where to put it. <laughs> it's really. Uh, there are many initiatives of people to put to student, I mean, children together. One of the biggest. Did you see those little houses for widows we built? Most of those women have lost their own children. So what we have done is to match the people who have uh, lost their children, help them, but take in some children. So throughout the whole country, you have situations like that. At the same time also, we, we, we had started to develop a big program of uh, children who lived in the cities, who were homeless. You know, they were homeless children throughout the whole country. You know, it, it's, a, it's a matter of, uh, you know, the problem is still there. And they tried institutionalize, uh, institutionalization, they tried many different things, but at the same time, there was never any solution because one of the things that happened after a genocide, more children survived than grown-ups. More children. There were many children. In the region we are in, there were about 300,000 children. You can imagine what it means. You know? So you found families with children as the head of families, for instance. Uh, and, uh, so it's, a, it's a still a big problem. You know, what Rwanda has done was to open education, at least primary education for everybody, including the, the, the orphans. So they give what they call farge is the money from the government to help those children who don't have any families.
was the history that came to this, that you can present yourself or get out of there. Yeah. Uh, Right. <coughs> it's very small. <coughs> there is no ocean. No. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a landlocked, uh, very small. Uh, was never helped by oh, UN. Well, is it last? I mean, is it over now, or is it still going on? Genocide lasted from uh, uh, April. We are starting the commemoration on the seventh, on the seventh of April, and by uh, beginning of July, it was over. The beginning of July. So 1994. It was three months long. It's about three months. How many years? About months, three months? Three months, yeah. Yeah, but within three months, about a million people died. It was horrible. Do you have statistics? How many people did it? How many were killed? You, you know, I mean, the numbers keep changing. Uh, some people talk about 800,000 died. Other people talk about a million people. Uh, people say more than 300,000 people were involved in the killing. So it's really, really difficult to evaluate, I mean, to assess the numbers of people. Uh, Before this happened, uh, who occupied it? Which of the European countries were there a long time ago? You, uh, let me tell you, it's a long story, but... Yes. <laughs> 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 it's a long story, but before it was Germany, then Belgium. Belgium, German. Germany. Germany and yeah. Belgium. Yeah. I learned in school a lot about Africa, but something else happened later like, on. Um, yeah. Any other questions? How was the female community affected by the genocide? Could you say that? Sorry, how was the female community affected by the genocide? How was the female community affected? Let me tell you, I, I think females were the most, the ones who were victimized by genocide more than anybody. Because uh, rape was a weapon of genocide. Uh, most of them were infected with HIV during that time. Even now we have a big community of self-help groups of women who, um, you know, who are dealing with HIV, with AIDS. But not only that, we have to raise children with a stigma because, and those children, it's a big problem in Rwanda when we talk about orphans, the, the children of rape. Uh, you know, you are raped by somebody who has killed your family, but now you are carrying the children. It's one of the, the toughest things. And sometimes those children are rejected, even by the mother. So it has been uh, one of the toughest things, especially for females, but also the most uh, incredibly resourceful elements in Rwanda uh, especially when you look at what the, 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 the women have become. You know, they changed the constitution benefiting women. Now they occupy the highest proportion in the world in the parliament, 56% are women. Uh, all the ministries, Minister of Foreign Affairs and so on are women. So women have a voice right now. And uh, that's one of the, the, what I can call the positive development coming out of genocide, if we can talk about that. But also the most oppressed, the most exploited, you know, sexually, uh, whatever level you are talking about. And also to take care of the children who are left behind, whether they are their children or whatever. Yeah, so, too many things. Yeah. If I could interject, you would comment one, um, on the changes that have been made in religion mm -hmm. in Rwanda. What was the most, uh, largest religion before and what has happened since? Yeah, uh, Rwanda was a Catholic nation, Catholic. You know, we were colonized by Belgium, so we inherited the Catholicism, pretty much. So if you look at the, the, the religion in Rwanda, they were about to 90, uh, they say 85 to 90 percent were Catholic. Uh, very few in, among the Muslims or the other de denominations. But the majority of the people, if you talk about those memorials that Simon was talking about, most people are buried in churches. 
and they didn't go to church for, by accident. They were called by their bishops. As a matter of fact, last week, one of the bishops who was involved in the genocide died, and you should see what the people wrote about it. And so, very mild protest from Rome. You know, the, you know, if you talked about the Roman Empire, you know, I mean the Pope. For the Rwandans, he was the highest authority. If you talk about the Pope, he's the most important person. And there was not really any strong voice against the genocide. Uh, there are arguments that if the bishop of any place in Rwanda had stood up and say, stop this, people could have stopped. People went to church because they thought they could get some kind of asylum. They didn't. So, and they were the bishop who called them. So there was a, a mass, uh, how do I say it, alienation be, between the, the Catholic Church and the people. So they, they've embraced new age type of churches, or, or, or some of the people just abandoned the church, or some of them re restrengthened their own uh, appartenance to Islamic faith. Because in Rwanda, they, they have that idea that the Muslims didn't participate in the killing. The only group they said that we were able to, to hold together the Hutu and the Tutsis were the, the Muslims. You know, and, and that was a tiny thing, it was on the fringes. But now it's growing in, in terms of influence, for instance. But those are the, it's the evolution based upon how people were treated in the church and lack of protection and so on and so forth. You know, they felt doubly betrayed. That's why I was talking about the institution if you look at the, the most important institution in Rwandan society was their church and their family. And if you look at that, they have been uh, affected by genocide. You know. We still have those issues even among family members who can't come together because of the issue. Do you know? Um, are there any kind of mental health facilities or, or organizations that help survivors deal with the trauma of what they witnessed, of any kind of post-traumatic stress disorders that they're, they're helping with? That's from everywhere. I mean, we have groups from San Francisco. Uh, we have a big group from, uh, I mean, Americans go in large, large numbers. You know, they go to, to treat, they, they have seminars. Uh, that's why we started the social work program at the university in Butare. Uh, that I was among the people studying the program. That was for that specifically. Because even though you were talking about orphans, you were trying to help, but it was not just about economic help. It was dealing with their trauma. You know, we were talking about many different things. But, and then in Missouri, they have what they call step up when people from the university go and volunteer, do those kind of stuff. So mental health is there. Doesn't mean, you know, of course, we. You know, sometimes it's very difficult to find a mental health that is culturally sensitive, mm -hmm. that understands that a woman will tell you, for instance, what is happening. People usually in Rwanda don't talk. So it's very difficult to get that kind of treatment. She's a psychologist, she knows, and she has treated people. And he's a psychiatrist. But the, the cultural thing is very difficult, for instance. So when they go, they have to be trained in the cultural sense and, you know, and then are able to help. But there are many institutions and people who are going to Rwanda to do that. Yeah, I, I would like to touch up to what she was saying about religious. Uh, growing up, you know, I was brought up Catholic. So every Sunday, it was church day. You go to church. And, you know, you dress nice. You know, we didn't have a lot of nice clothes, but you put on whatever nice you have. You go to church, we eat good food. And there was no work on Sunday. And you know we just believed in God, and due to that, a lot of people got killed inside the church, because you know when the whole thing started, people say, "If I go to church, nobody can touch me. I'm inside the church." Yeah. But that's not what happened. A lot of people got killed inside the church. Mm -hmm. this, Simon, your story is fascinating. Yes, that's the Did number. They, when what you, happened to these people? Did they reintegrate? Or what, how do they hold that numbers the they, Once again, this is really when you, you see how our society is, 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 is very complex. 
Most of the people who have killed were able to avoid the whole justice system. Because let me tell you what happened. Uh, Rwanda at the time of genocide had about two courts, yeah, you know, two, uh, how would I say? Uh, they had one Supreme Court, and then lower courts, there were maybe three in major cities. Few judges. We didn't have any attorneys. It means that when, and there were three jails, three. Usually that were, uh, you know, getting, yeah. And so what happened was that the majority of the people who killed left for Congo. And, and you see the movement, if you can find that picture on my, my thing. When you, when you see these people coming back, because Rwanda gave amnesty, you know, because these people were still invading from Congo, they took all the weapons, the military, you know, and, and they were the generals, they took all their weapons, so they were invading Rwanda again. So what Rwanda did was to issue some kind of amnesty, come back, you are going to be able to be resettled back to society. That was 1996. So when they came back, Obviously, they came back to their neighborhoods, the majority of them. And you find one survivor, because if you survive as a Tutsi, that was a miracle. It was really a miracle to tell you, the, the ones in the country. So it means that when they came, you find like 10 people living in the neighborhood, like where Simon was. These are people coming back from the Congo. Over one, you know, 1,500,000 came back. This is a mass, mass group of people coming back and the majority implicated in the Rwanda genocide. So you don't have any justice system. The international tribunal didn't even judge more than 40 people, 40. And they have the resources, the one in Tanzania. So Rwanda started the system called the Gachacha. Gachacha was the traditional way to try to deal with justice. It, it means that pretty much what you did was to choose among your your people, the ones with integrity, and they are going to judge the, 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 the people. But it relied on an understanding it was more, uh, it was to reset you in society, not so much punitive. So you accept what you have done, uh, the people judge you, and they assign crime and punishment based upon what you did during genocide. If, for instance, you killed 50 people, you committed rape, then you were given certain years or you were given a community work, or you, you know, so there are too many things. So you can imagine now when it's, what he was saying, when you live with people, you know very well you have killed your parents. You know, when I went back, I could see someone who killed my father. You know, and you live together, you have to live together. There is no, you know, and the thing is, they say if they had gone through the traditional way of judging people, it could have taken more than 300, uh, no, 100 years. Just to look at one case, one case. Each case, I mean, to, to, to go in front of the judge and do those kind of stuff. So what they wanted, I mean, there was a night towards rehabilitation, rehabilitation, reconciliation, moving forward. So they created all those kind of covenants, symbols of reconciliation to try to move forward. Because in most cases, there, there was no choice, really, <laughs> when you think about it. You know, you couldn't split the country. Uh, you couldn't do whatever. You couldn't deal with justice. So what they did was to do a symbolic justice and move forward and try to to patch up and and, and 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 you know I have to say that really people are pretty successful that way. You know they they, they just did the scorecard. 99% of all the children in high school from high school to university. Their hope is it is not to call them Hutu or Tutsi. Just to be Rwandan and to start moving forward. They have started to date. Before the society was pretty much polarized, it was impossible to even get it together. So, but it's a, I think it will take a whole generation for Rwanda to, to heal. I, I don't even know if a generation will be enough. I really don't think so. And bright, wonderful children. Yeah, yeah. If so we another, are there, another way to look at it, some of those people, they're your neighbors. Yeah. So. Yeah, you're asking what happened to those 3,000 people. Some of them were in prison, others are your neighbors. Yeah. It almost seems like recognition when you say moving forward, trying to move forward, uh, almost like a recognition of his, um, mass hysteria or something in a way for a three month period, this kind of carnage. We have re 
been really uh, been after the mastermind. And I'm lucky to say that people have been taken even from Canada, from the United States. Recently, one of the guys who has been the mastermind of killing was brought back to Rwandan justice. So those are the people who are telling people to go and kill their neighbor. But the regular people, you know, it, it was like a mass hysteria. It was, um, I don't even know how to call it. People said it was hell, you know. I, but some people, you ask them and you say, are you happy the Tutsi are dead? They say, why would I be happy? My life is not improved. Actually, I feel miserable. I don't have neighbors. You know, I mean, it was just madness, but it was really driven by political gains. That's why I was saying that um, if there's any lesson, one thing to, to try to do is, is to take out bad governance, especially people who are, who are driving those points. And I think what people have learned is that this was really a no-win situation for anybody, including the killers. So I, I hope it will be a lesson for them. That's all I, I, can, I can say, but uh, you know, when you talk about reconciliation, there was something that was revolting to me. You know, when you, you say reconciliation, it has a sense of saying people have repented, right? You know, people say, I accept what I have done, and now we are re moving forward. Most people didn't. But I think it's a, it's a, it's a way of, of, of having peace in yourself and then try to deal with that situation more than really forgiving somebody else, you know, because... Uh, as I understand it, there was a UN criminal tribunal. Yes. Some people were brought. And it seemed to me that the, the massive nature of this carnage, as the gentleman put it, makes it <coughs> makes it necessary to go after the leaders right. to see to it that they are punished and that there's a record established of what they did. To what extent does that happen and how do the people of Rwanda view that? You know, so, yeah, go ahead. Please. Uh, use my overly loud voice. The, the question is about whether there was a trial after the UN trial or an ICC trial. <laughs> and what attempt was made to go after the perpetrators of the hierarchs. Yeah, that's really, you know, the International Tribunal in Tanzania has tried quite a number of, uh, very few, <laughs> you know. We believe that since they have the resources, they will try more than what Rwanda is doing. But uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good thing because it's an open trial. And people come from Rwanda, some people come from, and they bring all the experts, the lawyers. Sometimes the lawyers that have been also a big issue here because they deny genocide. They listen to those killers, they don't listen to the people who, who have done it. You know, even in the United States, there are lawyers who go and defend them. And these people have a right to, to be defended, obviously. That's, but at the same time, what I'm saying, and what you said is right, is that and I agree with that is that the big names, the ones who masterminded the genocide should be judged publicly. And what it achieves for the whole society in Rwanda is that it creates a certain collective memory. This was a bad thing. Look at what these people and the ideology they put out there. There are documents I can send you. A guy who was saying, the one who was brought back from Canada two months ago was saying, the Tutsis, they needed to go back home. And the back home they are talking about is in Ethiopia through the river by using the Nile. So you have to cut their heads, put them in the river, send them back. And it's in the speeches. It's not even. So what we call media of genocide in Rwanda was very, it was a big factor in the genocide in Rwanda. Because that's the only medium people could listen to the radio. The radio was the one that was calling people from the end. We didn't have any television during that time. It was the radio. Most people didn't read anything. What they call the Ten Commandments of the Hutus, talking about killing the Tutsis, was through the radio. Go and work. You know, killing Tutsi became work. And so it was almost like a positive thing to do. You know, and the whole demonization process 
that went on before they started to kill the, the Tutsis. Those people are there. And the, the good thing is that those were judged by the international tribunal where the world can see uh, what happened. You know, at least for the few who were uh, able to be judged. They have studied the judgment for the one from Canada. You we'll see how it, you know, it fans out. But, uh, Yes, please. Uh, thanks for coming back to my question. Uh, it, it, it almost seems like a horrible storm that started, that lasted for three months and was over. How did it end? The, go ahead, if you want to say. I guess the RPF won. <laughs> uh, it was a planned thing. You know, it was all planned from the beginning. So, the RPF, which was not allowed to come into the country from Uganda, finally took over the whole country. Uh, and then, you know, they took over and then the entire Hamwe, the, the Hutu extremists, they couldn't kill anymore, you know. So, I, is that answer your question? Yeah. No, no, no. Like, I'm not sure how to explain any further. So, the RPF took over, basically. So, the government that were encouraging the Hutu extremists was no longer in control. Mm -hmm. So the former government was pushed to Congo to Tanzania and then RPF took the country and they have been in power since, uh, since the genocide. So pretty much they stopped the genocide uh, before then. And, and there was a brush fire. It was like a br people were killing on their way out. You know, the, the whole region between Congo and Rwanda. Like the region we come from, people died at the last minute because those people leaving the, the central government were killing people as they left the whole country. So. The tension? I, I would say in the country, it's, it's amazing. This is seriously to, to account for any kind of progress going there. It's because something that we were, we were actually against before. People outside were against how the government was dealing with things, especially that idea of, of trying to, to promote the Rwandanese instead of Hutu Tutsi. Because we're saying before you can actually say no Tutsi, no Hutu, you have to, to look at what happened first. You, you can't just go on um, uh, historical amnesia. You can say we are going to forget and forgive. You have to account for why it happened before you can move to achieve the true Rwandan character. But what they have done, and this is a political will, it's a political choice, but it's working. Because of the new generation, when you go, for us who are, uh, we are the bad ones, when you go and you say, uh, if you ask that question, it's almost like an insult. If you say, are you Hutu or Tutsi, you say, why are you trying to do that? I'm Rwandan, I'm proud to be Rwandan, and this is what, and that idea, because you can create, the, the way you express yourself, the language are a big thing, you know that. Be, because, for instance, language can demean, it can create uh, some sense of empowerment, and so on. In Rwanda being Rwandan has been one of the, especially for a younger generation, not, to, not to like us who, who suffered because we were Tutsi. When you try to say Tutsi, of course, I mean, you know, but the ones in Rwanda have been able to move forward. Uh, they, they, because they have to work together, uh, they are paired, uh, those youth type of organization each, each year, what they call Mugando. Uh, the intermarriages that are occurring right now, I think I really have hope for the future generation. In my view, that's how I see it. You know, it's more integrated and people don't seem to care like, you know, the people who, who are deeply connected to being part of the, the killers or, the, the, or the, the victims. You know, that kind of looking at society in a, in a certain dichotomy doesn't exist among young people. Or at least it's, it's less than that kind of thing. And of course, I think it's also of, because of that purpose. They believe their country is on a solid course. They go to school. I think also uh, that kind of economic leverage helps a little bit. You know, uh, they are not as desperate as most people were a couple of years back. And then also for me, you know, tension is definitely still strong. 
and that's because I've been here. You know, when the genocide happened, I was all I was blessed enough to get out of there. I got adopted. I'm here. So when I go back, the tension is still there. But I believe time heals. Mm -hmm. You know, so those who are in Rwanda, Tutsis or Hutus, it doesn't matter. They learn how to get along. They learn mm -hmm. how to live with each other. Right. So. You know, as the time goes on, I think the tension gets lesser and lesser and lesser.